Good morning. So I'm usually in with the kids, so you don't see me up here very often, but I do enjoy to get up here every once in a while and share the word with you. Um, you know, I do a lot with the Christmas story every year. Uh, we do a Christmas play. I hear it all the time, and as we all do, you know. We watch movies, we see plays. It's just part of the season that we retell the story. Many of us know it by heart, and I think that sometimes we watch it and we listen to it and we even tell it kind of on autopilot. Um, it's, it's an easy thing to do, and it's easy for us to get caught up in the tradition and lose sight of the reality of the story. Um, so many things had to happen for God's Son to come to earth and to come to earth in the right way and in a way that we would know that He did it. Sometimes I think that the myth and the tradition can kind of cover up a reality that's filled with difficulty and, and personal cost to the people involved. But to delve into some of that tradition that's not mentioned in the Bible, uh, did you know the innkeeper is not mentioned in the Bible? In fact, if you go in the Greek, it doesn't even really mention an inn. Um, in the Greek, it says there was no guest room. Now, houses in those days had very few rooms. In fact, many of them didn't have a bedroom because you just basically had a mat. They didn't actually have mattresses like we would have. They'd have a mat that they roll out and sleep on. And so many houses didn't have a bedroom. A lot of them had open courtyards. Um, your poorest of houses would only have two rooms. And they were, those were two rooms that were found in every house. It was kind of a common area. And then off to the side, you would have a room where they stored stuff. So they, they'd keep like their plows in there and all of their farming stuff that they had to have and any of the stuff that they weren't using that that particular season they would put over in the storage room and they might feed animals in there from time to time when they needed to come in out of the weather um, and it wasn't what we think of as a stable sometimes it was attached sometimes it was detached sometimes it was a cave built close to the house but it was more akin to what we think of as a garage than a stable it was usually the only closed off room from the rest of the house. And so Jesus was born probably in that room because there was no guest room in the house. And so he's laid in a manger because it was there. <laughs> Another thing that is in our Christmas plays all the time that, that we, uh, we don't necessarily, not necessarily in the Bible, the three kings. In the Bible, they're not numbered and they're not called kings because um, they probably weren't. They were obviously men of learning because they were studying the stars and they were obviously of high status because they could go and get an audience with Herod. But the Bible doesn't call them kings. It calls them magi or wise men. And it doesn't say how many they were. there were. It just says there were more than one. So judging by what they were doing, they were probably actually on a diplomatic mission from their kingdom. Because you get this great king that's born next door in the next door kingdom, what are you going to do? Go bring him gifts. They're on a, they're on a diplomatic mission to kind of gain some favor with the Romans because the Romans hadn't conquered to the east yet. So they're on a diplomatic mission coming to see the newborn king. Although... James is going to be disappointed about this. But next year, the Christmas play will not feature 
the Christmas garage, and the multiple diplomatic scientists. I know you're upset, James, but I'm not going to do it. <laughs> Another tradition that we often have but the Bible doesn't talk about is the donkey. Donkey is never mentioned in the Bible. You know, Mary could have walked those 80 miles from Nazareth to Bethlehem while pregnant. Or they could have had a cart and Joseph could have pulled her 80 miles. Imagine how difficult that was on Joseph. And I don't mean this in a, in a bad way, ladies. But when you're pregnant, it's difficult to travel with you, even in modern times. <laughs> Raise your hands. Anyone who's traveled with a pregnant lady, did you get there on time? No. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Honestly, the only thing more miserable than traveling with a pregnant lady is probably traveling while pregnant. Just saying. Um, my wife and I, when we were pregnant with, well, she was pregnant with Bella. I was in a support role. Um, we had to travel about 80 miles. We had to go from where we were living to the embassy in Seoul. And she was nine, nine months pregnant because we didn't have the right paperwork the first time, so we had to go back. And so we had to, actually, I had bought a car at that time, but it wasn't worth driving to Seoul because you can't park anywhere. So we got in the car and we drove to the train station. And then we took a train to Seoul Station, and then we took a subway, and then we had to get out of the underground subway and walk to the embassy. Okay? And this took quite a bit of time, and Laura's nine months pregnant, and it was, uh, it was not easy, um, but we made it. And on the way back, um, I have to buy tickets to, for, the new, for the other train, because I don't know how long it's going to take us. And so I go buy tickets, and I get done, and she says to me something that should have prepared me for parenthood, but I wasn't ready for it yet. She said to me, I have to use the bathroom. And you have to understand that in Korea, using the bathroom is not like it is here. Okay, so they, she goes in the Seoul station. There's one Western-style toilet. All of the others are basically holes in the ground that flush. They're like squatty potties. And of course, everyone wants to use that Western toilet, and Laura's nine months pregnant. The squatty potty's out of the question. And so she's in line for a very long time. And she's in line, and she gets towards the end of that line, and the toilet paper is at the end of the line not in the stall. So there's like some pre-estimation that goes on and there's some dire consequences if you underestimate but you are being judged by the rest of the line behind you. So, so that all gets done but it takes a long time and now we're going to be late for our train and it does not wait for you in Korea and the next train isn't for another two hours so we either have to book it to the train while pregnant or I have to wait two hours in a train station with a pregnant lady. And uh, the two hours was not something either of us were interested in, but she couldn't walk very fast. And I couldn't do anything about it because anyone who's been around a pregnant lady knows that piggyback rides are not an option <laughs> at nine months. It does not, I didn't try, but I didn't think it was going to end well if I did. So. We finally get on, we managed to get on the train with just about a minute to spare. And we get our seats and we make it, make it back and we get in our car. And we're kind of laughing about it like, man, we're glad that's over. And we pull up to our apartment complex and they're working on the building. And we can't take the elevator. And we live on the ninth story. <laughs> so nine floors later, we're both exhausted, and 24 hours later, we're parents. <laughs> and that's what it was like traveling 80 miles 
with my wife nine months pregnant. And we had trains and cars and we don't know that they had anything. That was a very tiring and emotionally draining journey. You know, Joseph is doing all this and he's caring for his young wife who, if you think about it, is not carrying his baby. A woman that six months before, he was ready to divorce and it literally took an act of God to stop him. And here he is, having to travel 80 miles It's like here to Gatlinburg. But imagine walking that. You know, there's a few things that break up marriages. Finances, perceived infidelity. Stress from, you know, family and, and adding things, job situations. Um, I love my wife. We're great together. We work together all the time. We've been in ministry for 10 years but we've discovered that we cannot move together. The only time that we've ever mentioned homicide was when we were trying to move. And she told me the last move that the next time we move, I'm going to go to work and I'm going to get back and everything's going to be packed and on the way to the new house and she's going to text me the address. I told her that's a great idea. Let's do that. And, but Joseph gets all of that right out the gate. Because after this huge journey, he's got to pay taxes. All of that. You cannot tell me that they didn't fight on the way to Bethlehem. There had to be some argument on the way to Bethlehem. It happened, guys. And they get there, and there's no room for them. They get the garage. And they couldn't have been there long before the baby came. Because you have to remember, Joseph's a builder. I know it says carpenter, but carpenter and stonemason are essentially the same thing in this culture. Most houses are built of stone and and wood, and in, in our culture we have cabinet makers and um, framers and like fine carpenters, guys that do trim, finish carpentry, and you know there's a lot of different divisions. In their culture there wasn't, like you either built, like you built things, and their primary building material was stone reinforced by wood. And so he's a builder. And he's not even there long enough to build a crib. Right? He couldn't have been there long. And it's time for the baby. And we don't know what Mary's delivery was like. Mary, they could have called the town midwife and, you know, they put incense up and turned the lights down and everything went cool. Or it could have been Joseph standing in the corner, covered in fluid, yelling, I don't know nothing about delivering babies. What am I supposed to do? We don't know, but it was probably somewhere in between the two. And personally, I like the picture of Joseph screaming in the corner. But we don't know. In all of this, though, God was with them. And all of this difficulty and all this personal sacrifice. You know, Joseph was a just man. And here his fiance gets pre pregnant before they're married. Don't think people weren't looking at Joseph. Imagine how that would have ground on the both of them. That may have been why they got the garage. I don't know. But God was with them. He was working his plan. If you'll turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 14. This 
So I just want to tell you the Lord is good, and that thing that Carol read was not planned. She, she planned it independently of me. And you'll see why that's significant right here. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will be of great joy, that will be for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God, saying, not singing. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace to men on whom his favor rests. And the angels leave, and they go to Bethlehem, and they see the baby. And then it says this, But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. This is the word of the Lord. So, shepherding at that time is not like what we think of it now. Did you know that modern farms... The way that we see them today with like all their big fences and pastures, that didn't happen until barbed wire was invented. Um, like if you go look at like really old farms, you'll see like stone walls around fields. Well, those weren't cow pastures. That's where they plowed. And they would hit a rock and then they'd go stack it up at the edge of the field and that's how you got those stone walls. Those weren't to keep cattle in. In fact, most of them are too low. So... Modern fencing didn't happen until 1874. And to put that in context, it's five years before the light bulb. Okay? It's relatively modern. And so the way it worked back then is they'd have a head shepherd and he would go up on a hill or in a tower and he would look out at the landscape and he would look for green. Right? Because, gr you know, Sheep, if you leave them in one place, they'll eat all the way to the roots. And so he'd go up there and look for green, and he would direct the other shepherds. Go over here, go over here, go over here. And so it was common. They could get really far away from the town. And it, so it was actually common that they would stay out at night with the sheep. But a lot of times after the sheep bedded down, so did the shepherds. But the shepherds were doing something different in this passage. And a lot of scholars have pointed to this that says they're living out in the fields and keeping watch by night. And either of those things were very common, but both of those things together were not as common unless the lambs were getting ready to give, or the ewes were getting ready to give birth. And so the shepherds are out there in the fields, and when, when ewes give birth, shepherds are kind of like husbands. They don't have a whole lot to do. They, uh, they just basically kind of stand guard during the process. But after the baby is born, after the lamb is born, they have a lot to do. They have to clear airways. They have to check to make sure the baby's healthy. They check to make sure the mom is healthy. They, uh, they make sure that all the afterbirth... Yes, Jessica, that's the exact face you should make. <laughs> Makes it out okay. And that the cord gets cut at the right length so it won't get infected. All of those things, they normally cut it themselves, but they have to make sure it's at the right length and the baby's going to be healthy. And the most important thing that a shepherd does is it makes sure that the baby lamb nurses within the first hour. It's very important. So the shepherds are out in the fields waiting to deliver a baby. And the angel of the Lord comes to them. And these babies are probably going to be used in sacrifices because they're not far from Jerusalem. 
And so the angel comes to them and says, Today, in the city of David, a Savior is born to you. There's a baby over here in the city. He is Christ the Lord. He's wrapped in swaddling clothes and laying in a manger. And the shepherds go. And I want, I want to point out what the shepherds are leaving. That is all of the wealth they've acquired in their life sitting out there in the fields. It's akin to you taking all the money out of your bank account, sitting in a field for a few hours, and then coming back later. That's what they did. And they leave, and they go, and they see the baby. And I've heard preachers speculate on why God came to shepherds for years, why he didn't come to kings or priests or some other person of high status. But if he had come to a king, that king wouldn't have got the significance. He, he wouldn't know what to do with a mom and a baby. <laughs> no clue. If he had come to a priest, the priest couldn't touch anything in that room or else he'd be unclean. God came to shepherds not because of their status, but because they were able because they were available and they understood. And Mary, all of these things, she treasured them in her heart. She pondered them. And the shepherds, after leaving this young family in a garage, go rejoicing and praising God, glorifying Him. Because they were of able to get a first-hand experience of the kingdom of God. At its very beginning. And they understood it. They saw it. And I wonder how often in our daily lives each of us takes time to make ourselves available to God. Most of us have been in church for years. We have the understanding. We know God. We, we're in a relationship with Him. But do we stop and make ourselves available? I want a show of hands. How many of us would like to see our church move forward? Show of hands. Okay. How many of us really want to see God move? We want to see Him move in our church, in our community. How many of us want to see that? Okay. How many of us want to see people in this church saved and baptized by the dozens? Yes. How many of us had a face-to-face -face conversation about faith with a person who didn't believe last year? Some of us. If I'm going to be honest, I have to put my hand down for that one. I had a very busy year. I, I did a lot with children's ministries, but all those kids got saved the year before. So, But I have to put my hand down for that one. And it was somewhere in the past week when we were in Walmart um, the pastors, I think some of you have heard it, actually made it in the paper, but none of our names are there, thank goodness, that we were out at Walmart passing out gift cards to families who were in need. And we were going around, and me personally, I was asking people, um, sitting there praying, looking out at people, asking them, do you need help this Christmas? And I had people crying and giving me hugs one lady just fat, flat out ugly cried right there, just bawled. And it dawned on me that had I just gone to the store, we found 15 people in about 25 minutes, but if I had just gone to the store, I wouldn't have seen any of them. 
None of them. Because I wasn't looking. And if we want to see God's kingdom move and come in here, it's got to move and come out there first. And honestly, if our plan is to save everyone that comes through the doors of this church, that's ludicrous. It is. Not that we shouldn't save them, but that's like living on a lake and fishing out of a bucket. We spend the vast majority of our time out there. We're in here, what, maybe an hour, two hours a week? If we're not the kingdom of God out there, we'll never be the kingdom of God in here. Never. And if we want to see God move among us in here, he's got to move among us out there. And we've got to make ourselves available to him. Living with our eyes open, waiting for him to show us someone to lead to Christ. God has got to lead that. I'm not telling anyone to go you know, stand out on the corner and, and preach this afternoon. That's not what I'm saying. God has got to lead that. God has got to lead you to people. Because if, if, if you ever listen to the parable of the sower, the word falls on different people in different places. And when it's good soil, God does amazing things with it. And so God has got to lead that. And you don't have to go to seminary. You don't have to study the Roman road or go through 12 steps. Um, you have to make yourself available to God. And those things, they may be helpful, but in truth, when you're in that situation and you're hooked up to God and he's put you in front of somebody, he will give you the words to say. Okay? If we're going to move forward as a church, we have got to make ourselves available to God. For some people like me, I'm a, believe it or not, I am a recovering introvert. I was a, I'm a very introverted person. I don't get my energy from people. I get my energy from my alone time. And alone time with God, sometimes just alone time with me. And I don't typically get it because I have three kids, but that's where I get my energy. But for someone like me, this is going to be difficult. It may be uncomfortable to put yourself out there to a person. But God didn't call some of us to go and make disciples. He called all of us. So, this time of year is the time that everyone is talking about New Year's resolutions. New Year's resolutions. And for most people, it's quite selfish. I'm going to lose weight. Or, I want to make more money this year. But what would it look like if we as a church resolved that we were all going to win people to Christ this year. And I'm not saying you have to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and go do it. You need to let God lead it. But if you never look for it, you'll never see that lead. If you're not thinking about it, unless God sends a choir of angels, you may not see it who obviously were not acquired because they were saying and not singing it. But anyways, we need to make ourselves available to God. And when we resolve to do something, that doesn't mean, it, it's not like setting a goal. My children, they're hilarious when they set goals. Um, because when they set a goal, 
they have no plan. They have, like, no, how am I going to remember this? They're like, hey, I really want to do this. And then they're playing with something else five minutes later. And so, except for JoJo. JoJo's different. JoJo, I remember once, she asked me for something. And I said, we'll do it when we get back, knowing we were going to be gone for like eight hours. And the second her foot entered that house again, she's like, all right, where is it? But she's different. She's different. So, but if we're going to resolve to win people to Christ, we need to write it in our mirror in the bathroom. We need to put it on the visor in our car. We need to pray about it every day. Lord, send me someone. Give me the words. Because guys... When we draw close to God every day like that, He helps us to open our eyes and see the people around us that need Him. And I can tell you this from experience, not this past year, but in previous years. I'm going to have to change the way I do things if I'm going to resolve to win people for Christ. And that's what I want to do this year. May that not just be your goal, but be a resolution that you think on and pray on every day. So, as we're thinking about this, as we're praying about this, as we're seeking the Lord for a minute, I have a song we're going to listen to. We're going to listen to that, and I'm going to pray. And Pastor Teresa is going to come and close us out. But take this time to sit and pray. And if you don't know what to pray, pray the words of the song. Okay. This world can be cold and bitter. It feels like we're in the dead of winter, waiting on something.
Lord, may your presence descend on us. May your spirit fill us that we may spread your good news. The good news of your Son who has come into this world to save us from our sins. Not that we dwell in them, not that we dwell in the sin and brokenness that we're in, but that we are saved from it, O oh Lord. Lord, I pray that you do a mighty work, not just in this church, but through this church and into our community and into our places of work and into all of the places that we go. Lord, I pray that you go before us and that you work and tend the soil before the seed is ever spread. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.